This is Portuguese. You can translate now. It's already. It's already. Everything is here already. Yeah, yeah. You put. Uh, um, I forgot to put Chile. No problem. Chile is Chile is okay, but Colombia you put. Colombia is there. Okay, that's Colombia is the most important. Colombia. Where is Colombia? Um, Egypt is in Myanmar as well as in other countries such as India, Sri Lanka. Distinguished scholars. Respected participants, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start our day three and final day of the Buddhist, the World Buddhist Peace Conference. We are going to start our proceeding very soon. I would like to invite all of you to hurry up to the conference hall so that we can start the day on time. Kindly proceed to the conference hall. We are going to begin the morning session in about five minutes' time. We are going to begin with the chanting of the um, Heart Sutra by the Chinese Bhikkhuni from Wu Shan in China. And we have a special keynote speech today from one of the uh, most important Buddhist leaders we have today. That is the rector of Mahajulalongkorn University in Thailand, the most venerable professor, Dr. Pra Pramap Pandit, who is also chairman of the United Nations Day of Wisak and International Association of Buddhist Universities. Venerable sisters, ladies and gentlemen, kindly proceed to the conference hall so that we can start this morning session on time. We're going to start the session in five minutes time. In five minutes time, kindly proceed to the conference hall. This morning, after the keynote speakers, all the speakers will be coming from Latin America, from Mexico, from Colombia, from Venezuela, from Brazil, Uruguay, and of course, from Spain itself. Um, most of them are Spanish, from Spanish-speaking countries, uh, except Brazil, which speaks Portuguese. Once again, venerable sirs, ladies and gentlemen, kindly proceed to the conference hall so that we can start our proceeding in any minute. Our keynote speaker today is one of the most important Buddhist leaders we have today. That is the most venerable Professor Dr. Pra Prama Pandit, Rector of Mahajira Longkorn University in Thailand. He is also the chairman of International Council for the United Nations Day of Wisak and the chairman of International Association of Buddhist Universities. Not just bringing the Buddhist world together, he also brings different faiths together on an international interfaith forum. Verses, ladies and gentlemen, today we have 
uh, morning session, afternoon session, like yesterday. The morning session, we have about eight speakers. And then the afternoon sessions at one o'clock, like yesterday. But Thailand from um, South Africa, Cambodia, Chile, Mexico. So there will be a panel discussion moderated by the Venerable Dr. Sakya Wong Wisut or Dr. Sukando. And today, by the end of the day, at the end of the closing session, this conference will issue a declaration called Siddhiku World Buddhist Peace Declaration. It will be issued in many languages, in Burmese, in English, and it's also been translated into Spanish, Thai and Portuguese. He, he delegates from other countries. If you think you can translate this document competently, uh, please approach me and we support you so that you can translate this into your own language. We want the message of peace to reach as far as possible to every corner of the globe. So far, arrangements are in place to translate this document into Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, it has, it's, it's being translated and being polished into Burmese as well. Lisena, to please take up a seat over there. And uh, Mr. Um, Rini Gracia Calendo from Mexico, also to take uh, a seat over there. And Reverend Zeng Gong Shaja from Colombia, from Colombia, Latin America, to also take a seat over there. And then Mr. Winston Velasco, Mr. Winston Velasco from Venezuela. And Mr. Ricardo Guerrero, President of the Association of Hispanic, the Buddhist Hall, Spain, that is the President of Association of, uh, uh, Sp of um, um, the Spanish speaking people from Spain. And Mr. Ricardo Sasaki from the Lander Institute in Brazil. Kindly take up your seat uh, just behind the, the podium. And Mr. Lautaro uh, Eduardo Me Pereira. This is from Uruguay. For some reason, the buses coming from the hotels are a little bit late this morning, so I beg your, uh, your pardon. I beg your pardon for the delay of the uh, start of this morning session. Once again, I'd like to invite the speakers just to take a seat behind the podium. Venerable Bhikkhu Nandisena, Originally uh, from Argentina, now the abbot of Damananta Vihara in USA, who is very active in the Spanish speaking world, who has recently set up together with his uh, colleagues 
a Buddhist institute in Mexico. A Buddhist studies institute in Mexico. And also Mr. Rene Gracia Galindo from Mexico. Uh, Reverend Zhang Gong Shaja from Colombia. Mr. Winston Velasco from Venezuela. Winston Velasco is from Instituto de Estudios Budistas Hispano, Venezuela. And I also like to invite Mr. Ricardo Guerrero, as he's already here, and Mr. Ricardo Sasaki from Brazil to kindly sit take the seat. เดี๋ยวเราไม่ดีเออตรวจชั้นที่ <laughs> Uh, this morning, well, we have <coughs> a keynote, keynote speech from the most venerable rector of Majula Lungkorn University in Thailand, the most venerable professor, Dr. Prabhupada who is also chairman of the International Council for the United Nations Day of Wisdom. He is also the chairman of the International Association of British Universities. After the keynote speech, we'll be listening to um, papers uh, mostly from Latin America, um, mainly the Spanish speaking world, but we do have one Portuguese. A speaker from Brazil. So our speakers, Venerable Bikut Nandisena, originally from Argentina, um, doing a lot of work in Mexico, residing in USA, the abbot of Damananda Vihara, over there in USA. Then Ms. Rene Gracia Calendo from Mexico, Reverend Zengong Shacha from Colombia, Mr. Winston Velasco from Venezuela and Ms. Ricardo Guerrero from Spain. Mr. Ricardo Sasaki from Brazil and Mr. Lautaro Eduardo Mepera from uh, Uruguay. Don't 
Venerable uh, sirs, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's time now to start our morning session. I would like to um, invite all of you to join me in reciting Namo Dasa three times to open this morning session. Kindly stand up and recite Namo Dasa. Namo Dasa Bhagavato Arahato Samhaang Sambuddhasa Namo Dasa Bhagavato Arahato Samhaang Sambuddhasa Namo Dasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. Thank you. Please be seated. Before our keynote speaker, I would like to invite the first speaker, Venerable Bhikkhu Nandisena, originally from Argentina, now on the Abbey of Dhamma Vihara in USA, to start the, this morning session. Our first speaker, Venerable Bhikkhu Nandisena, was ordained by him. Uh, one of the, the best known and most respected Myanmar scholar, Venerable Dr. Ashin Sila Nanda Biwamsa. And now, he, <coughs> Venerable uh, Bhikkhun Anisena has been very active in the Spanish speaking world. Thank you. Thank you, Venerable. First of all, I would like to thank uh, most venerable Dr. Ashin. Mianisara Sita Gusearo for inviting me to participate in this World Buddhist Peace Conference. Uh, members of the Mahasanga, ladies and gentlemen. The name of my paper, my presentation is, as you can see there, is Buddhism poised to make substantial and lasting contributions to world peace. So although the world today can be analyzed from different perspectives and various positive things can be found, the fact remains that terrorism, violence, and war, among other things, are a real and constant threat to destroying all that is good. Now, I think that regarding Buddhism, we can find two extremes. The first one is an undistorted knowledge of reality obtained not by faith, but through the experience of how things really are. I think this is one of the strengths of Buddhism, according to myself. And the second is an unconditional doctrine of peace found in its oldest texts. Those are, I think, two of the strengths of Buddhism. But now, I think we need to ask ourselves, are these strengths of Buddhism enough to make a global difference regarding world peace? Or, as the title of the paper says, 
is Buddhism poised to make substantial and lasting contributions to world peace. So I think, I mean, that all of us and many people in the world who are not Buddhist could agree that Buddhism is a religion of peace. But is this enough to make a global difference? I think this is an important question that has not been addressed yet here in this conference, and I'm going to do that myself. So I have limited time, so, so in order to answer this question, I think that we need to explore at least two points. The first thing that we need to explore is the numerical strength of Buddhism and, it, and its strengths. And the second thing that we need to try to answer is or explain how Buddhism operates nowadays in the world. So I'm going to try to answer these two points in this presentation. So regarding the first point, the numerical strengths of Buddhism and its trends, the information I'm going to share with you is taken from a report that was published in 2015 by the Pew Research Center. And the name of the report is, as you can see there, is the Future of World Religions Population Growth Projections 2010 2050. And if you are interested in the report, there is a link there. Oh, the link also is my presentation is in page 150 of the, the book that was distributed. So, so the information. To, to answer the numerical strength of Buddhism and its trends is taken from this report. So, and these charts are taken from the report and you have two columns. The left column, it shows the number of people in billions that follow different of the world religions. And on the right column, you have the percentage. And in, you can see Buddhism on the bottom left, in the year 2010, Buddhism was about 500 million people. And the projection for the year 2050 shows that Buddhism is going to remain the same, 500 million people. But if you take the, as a percentage of the world population, you can see the right a part of the chart, Buddhism on 2000, in the year 2010 is 7.1%, uh, but Buddhism is going to be, in the year 2050, 5.2%. So it's going to decrease a 2% uh, with regard to the global population. I cannot dwell much on these statistics, I mean, uh, there is another chart in the paper, I mean, I'm not going to go through, but this is the population, the Buddhist population by region in the world. Uh, but the, the report concludes saying that with the exception of Buddhists, all of the world major religious groups are poised for at least some growth in absolute numbers in the coming decades. That means that Buddhism is going to decrease. This is the one, one, going to be the only religion that's going to decrease in, in numbers, according to this report. So that was regarding the numerical strengths uh, and the trends of uh, Buddhism. But I want to focus on the second part, that is how Buddhism operates in the world. And I'm going to talk from the monastic Theravada uh, perspective. But I think some of these conclusions can be extended to other traditions too. 
So in the Theravada, in Theravada Buddhism, we can argue that historically, there are two paradigms for the propagation of the Buddha's teachings. So both paradigms are found in the Pali Canon. So the first paradigm we, call, we would call the original paradigm. And the other paradigm we can call the Sangha as merit paradigm. I'm going to explain these two paradigms now. So what is the original paradigm? The original paradigm, you have it there. So two months after the Buddha's enlightenment, there were 60 disciples, 60 arahants, and the Buddha sent these 60 disciples all over the world and told them that two should not go by the same way. So you can read the paper. Uh, so this was the original paradigm. At that time, there were not Buddhists in the world. So the Buddha sent every, the 60 arahants to different parts of the world. O okay, I have to be brief because I, I have limited time. But regarding the original paradigm, in the Theravada Buddhist world of today, with some exceptions, this original paradigm seems to be have seems to have been forgotten or it is completely ignored when trying to bring the Buddha Dhamma to new lands. For example, as a Burmese Theravada monk to go to Chile in South America to open a center when, where there is no Burmese resident community and this request would be dismissed right away as something outlandish. Or you can ask also a Thai monk or a Sri Lanka monk to do the same in Brazil, and also you would get probably the similar, similar response. So this is regarding the original paradigm. In the year 2015, in Ibero-America, which comprises all Latin American countries, including Brazil, a total of 20 countries with a population of around 600 million people, there are very few resident monks and centers. If you find a temple, center, or monastery in one of these 20 countries, there is a high likelihood that it, its existence is due to the support of resident ethnic communities. So this is briefly uh, about the original paradigm. And now we have the other paradigm that is, I call it the Sangha as merit paradigm. Let me explain what is this paradigm. This paradigm, which is predominant today in the Theravada Buddhist world, is based upon the Buddha's statement that the Sangha is an incomparable field of merit in the world. Anutaram punyaketan lokasa. So, this is the Sangha as merit paradigm. So according to this paradigm, the Sangha would establish itself in a place where there are already Buddhist followers. So that the Buddhist followers can do merit with the Sangha. Wow. On, on one hand, while the Sangha as merit paradigm has served Theravada Buddhism well in persisting in those places in which it became established, like Myanmar, Thailand, Sri Lanka, and other countries. On the other hand, in my opinion, I think this Sangha as merit paradigm is partly responsible for the lack of interest among large number of Buddhists in what does not belong to their own culture. So, so in this paper, that you can read in page 150, I explore these uh, the two topics, the numerical strength of Buddhism and its trends and how Buddhism operates in the world. And also, it was mentioned the two strengths of Buddhism, 
an undistorted knowledge of reality and a universal doctrine of peace. So, now, given the facts that today Buddhism represents 7% of the world population, which is expected to decrease to 5% by the year 2050, and that the monastic community apparently has a modus operandi ill-suited to the global world in which we live, the logical conclusion that can be drawn from these facts is that the effects of Buddhism regarding world peace and other pressing universal issues would, will be at best marginal. So I look at all the people who are here in this hall, maybe 200, 250, and I think 90% of the people I see here are Buddhist. But if I close my eyes, and, and I imagine that the people who are here uh, represent a sample of the seven billion people in the world. And let's say we have 200 people here, only 7% of you would be Buddhist, only 14 people. So maybe these people in these roads will be Buddhist, and all the people in this hall uh, would be belonging to other religions. So, so, for Buddhism, I think, to become a significant force for good, monastic Buddhism should again embrace the original paradigm. Monastic institutions should be reformed with this vision in mind. And Buddhist leaders should awaken to the reality that we live in a world where 93% of the population are non-Buddhist. So I still wonder, I mean, if Buddhist leaders really realize this. Venerable uh, Damasami mentioned the comfort zone in one of these uh, meetings that we have the, the other day. I mean, when you live, I mean, around Buddhists, I don't, you don't think about how the rest of the world is. Uh, so in a, way to, in, a way, in a way, the world today is not much different because most of the world does not be, know Buddhism than when the Buddha sent his 60 disciples to different parts of the world. Therefore, and this is to conclude, leaders from all branches of Buddhism should wisely understand the challenge and assume the role that would bring the Buddha Dhamma to the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Venerable Bhikkhu Nandisena. <coughs> Venerable Sirs, Your Excellencies, distinguished scholars, ladies and gentlemen, now it's time for our special keynote speech this morning. The keynote speaker, as I have mentioned earlier, is one of the most important Buddhist leaders of today, the rector of Mahajura Longkorn Rajwitiyalai University in Thailand. The most venerable brings together not just the Buddhists from all traditions, from different traditions and different parts of the world, but also people of all faiths when he initiated at the global level the Interfaith Forums in Thailand. So without further ado, I would like to respectfully invite the most venerable rector of Mahajir Longonrat Vitiala University, Professor Dr. Pra Prama Pandit, to deliver a keynote speech, most venerable. Most Honorable Janisra, respected members of the Sangha and friends in the Dhamma. I am here to 
give the moral support to the effort of Most Honorable Yanisara and Sitaku International Buddhist Academy for this initiative to draw our attention to peace. It's uh, at this transition period of the country, of this country, Myanmar. You know what I mean by transition. When the new government will come to uh, take over and usher in a new era of prosperity. Success and prosperity of Myanmar means a lot to my country, Thailand, and the ASEAN community. So peace and prosperity go together. You cannot expect to have much economic development and prosperity without peace. So to draw our attention to live together in peace and cooperation in this juncture, I think is significant. So I have to come. Most women say, I must come. Here I, I am to share with you my idea and life of my thought. As Verbal Namasami introduced uh, my work that I coordinate some kinds of activity to do something together. So I would like to explain my philosophy, my ideas behind my activities as rector of Mahajula Lungkorn Rajutialaya University and as president of the International Council for the Day of Visa, which has been granted special consultative status by the United Nations two years ago. My ideas uh, of working for peace started many years ago. To be, to be specific, uh, that is when I was invited to join with the religious readers in the uh, Millennium World Peace Summit held in the headquarters of the United Nations in New York in the year 2000. I was among the 1,000 religious readers from all faiths and religions in the world to be in the uh, General Assembly Hall of the UN. At that time, uh, we haven't heard about, uh, say, the crash of civilization or nothing. Only the end of Cold War. After the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, just nine years before 2000, so the collapse of the Soviet Union gave us the hope of peace in the world. Cold War, which uh, brought to the world the, the clash of political ideologies between the two camps, the free world, the so-called free world, and the communist world. The clash of the political ideologies dominated the scene of the world since has dominated the world arena 
after the end of the World War II. So after the collapse of the Soviet Union, no conflict between the super, super, two superpowers anymore, we hope we had no fear of nuclear war. At uh, the era of uh, Cold War, we religious leaders were invited to attend the uh, International Conference on Nuclear Disarmament here and there. No more that kind of conference nowadays. We don't have to live in the anxiety of the explosion of that kind of the problem any longer. So with this hope, we went to the United Nations Conference, the Millennium World Peace Summit. When we were together, we were inspired to do something together. I was very impressed by the sincerity and determination of all religious readers to work together for peace. The problem is not their intention. The problem is how. We declare strongly that no more war in the name of religion. Political leaders may wage war, but don't, don't kidnap, hijack our religions to be the culprit of conflict and war. You may wage war, fight against each other, not in the names of religions. If all religious readers of the conflicting party who claim that they are doing in the name of that, this and that religion come to declare in this way in each country, what do you think would happen? So this is strategy that we start there and try to implement. After, uh, after a meeting at uh, the United Nations in the year 2000, I personally, as rector of MCU, Mahajula Lungkola Yuna University, organized another meeting of religious readers in Bangkok at the United Nations Conference Center in Bangkok, the religious leader came to meet with each other. They set up what's called World Council of Religious Readers and declare their intention to work together. So this is what I have been doing. After that, I find it necessary to work for the Buddhist world. So in the year 2004, I called upon the Buddhist readers to go to Bangkok to celebrate the Buddha birthday, that is the Vesak day, in the year 2004, two years after setting up World Council of Religious Readers. After the celebration in the year 2004, we set up International uh, Association of Buddhist Universities, IABU, and Association of Theravada Buddhist Universities, ATBU, for ATBU is under the leadership of Most Reverend Janisara. Okay, this is a way that we have been doing. But the idea behind this philosophy, behind my effort, is something that I'm going, I'm going to explain to you. That I 
I believe that after the Cold War, we can live together in peace if another kind of conflict can be prevented and that is in our hands. They summarize it in the term of clash of civilizations. I don't know much about that, but it has something to do with religions. The end of Cold War means the end of political, the conflict of political ideologies. But in the information age, when the world is smaller, smaller in terms of convenience in transportation, a convenience provided by transportation, and communication. So the world is so small. What happens here and there can affect, affect the other part of the world simultaneously. That is the case of the mixture of different cultures through communication and transportation. People are in contact with each other easily. This is the world today. The advantage of uh, the speed of communication is there, no doubt. But if our, if our mind, people's mind are not prepared to be, to tolerate the invasion of different culture into our land, there will be the defense mechanism to insert, to assert our identity against the foreign cultures. Nationalism may not be there, but we go beyond the territory of our land and we identify ourselves with the framework of the culture in terms of religions. We are Buddhists, we are Muslims, we are Christians, we are Hindus. Then we join together as a block, Buddhist block, Christian blocks, to determine, to identify ourselves. As sometime, for example, in the ASEAN community that they are going to initiate this year, they call upon one vision, one identity. What identity? Ten countries in ASEAN try to find one identity, looking for it. How can we go beyond the foundation of cultures that religions? Myanmar is a Buddhist country, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, Singapore are Buddhist countries. Identity there. Whereas the Philippines is the Christian country. Malaysia, Indonesia, Brunei is our Muslim countries. Then they say we want identity of the 10 countries. How can we go beyond the boundaries of belief? That's why, that why our conference may be helpful to their mission of finding identity of the ASEAN community that try to set up a single market in the manner of EU, European Union, starting from this year. 
So with without careful deliberation, instead of finding unity, maybe bringing us close together without good preparation will be a cause of another conflict, clutch of civilization in these 10 countries. So we have to understand the pitfall, the drawbacks of our attempt. And this kind of conference can be helpful. Why? That is behind my effort. My thinking goes like this. Okay, talk in terms of the Buddhist strategy first and then compare with the UN UNESCO that we are working in that line. If we want to live in peace, live in peace or to have peaceful coexistence, where to start, where to begin. In, in the Buddhist analysis, the term peace in English is santi. Santi of peace can be divided in a negative and positive sense. In the negative sense, peace or santi means the absence of, of conflict, absence of war, no conflict, no war. In a positive sense of peace, it means the presence of harmony, the presence of unity, loving kindness. So in the Buddhist uh, term, or in, as the Buddha said, Sukha Sankhasa Samakhi, unity of the groups is conducive to happiness. However, in our way of thinking, in the Buddhist thinking, there are two kinds of peace. One is inside our mind. It's called achatta santi, inner peace. And the second is bahida santi, outer peace. The first one is the peace of mind, peace of mind. The second is peace in society, peace in the world. Two kinds of peace. Where to begin? It begins with our mind, each individual mind. Our strategy begins here to purify our mind of the unwholesome defilements like greed, hatred, and ignorance, avijja, which are the conditions for not having peace in the mind. So we begin with purification of our mind. Once our mind is peaceful, this inner peace is the foundation of peace in society, peace in the world. That's why the Buddhist culture directly goes to the training of mind. Buddhist education in Pali is Sikha. Sikha is translated as education. Some people, uh, some was translated as training. So Sikha, there are three kinds of Sikha or training for peace of mind. One is Sila, the first is Sila, to observe precepts. The second is Samadhi, concentration, to cultivate the virtues in your mind. And the third one is Panya, or wisdom, 
to see things that they are, to see interdependence of everything, to get rid of ignorance. So the more you, so I, I would call it, first sila is the control of behavior, not to kill, not to steal, not to uh, commit sex, uh, sex, uh, sexual misconduct, etc. This is the control of your behavior. But behavior stems from your mind. So the second education, step education is meditation, training of your mind, control of behavior and training of your mind, meditation. And Myanmar is well known for meditation practice. This is the line of thinking in Buddhism. But the aim of meditation and training is that you get rid of ignorance to see patitja samubhada, the pedentary origination that we have to live depending others on others. Man is not island by himself. Even a country cannot be island by itself. One country cannot pros prosper alone with neighboring country are in conflicts. So this is interconnectedness. We go beyond the ignorance of our supremacy, of our selfishness, to see the network of people, of culture. Emptiness, sunyata in Buddhism means there is no single identity that can exist by itself alone. Everything has to be componenting with different component mix together, become a person, become microphone, everything, even a nation. To be humble, to purify your mind of ignorance of your egoism, selfishness, sunyata, emptiness, in Theravada and Mahayana, means a lot. When you see that no one can exist alone, it means we have to depend on others. Loving kindness would be there, compassion would be there. Metta karuna kam. Automatically. This understanding of the true meaning of life is wisdom. What is wisdom? Panya in Pali. Wisdom in the original sense means the realization of the relationship between man and God in the Christian tradition. Wisdom is that. Relation between man and God. Relation, so in terms of, in Pali, word Panya means realization of relationship of everything in the world. Patitja Samukbada, interconnectedness, dependent origination. When you realize dependent origination, you have wisdom. To understand that everything has to depend on each other because you see anatta, non-substantiality, non selflessness, etc. So anatta and patitya samupada are the two faces of the same coins. This is panya. So how we train our followers to get rid of ignorance and gain wisdom to see that we have to live together to depend on each other. This is the Buddhist strategy and we invent the training, the Sikha, three-form training. So this line of thinking reflected in the preamble of UNESCO, on, of the constitution of UNESCO. When I went to uh, deliver my speech at the headquarters of UNESCO in Paris, 
I came across the pillar there. A quotation of one sentence from the preamble of UNESCO Constitution in many languages, which I could not read except English. You can go to see there. Big pillar. It's inscribed like this. Since war begins, since wars begin in the mind of men, it is in the mind of men that it, the defense of peace must be constructed. Read it in many languages. Seems to be the key sentence of the preamble of the Constitution of the United Nations. Then they elaborate a little bit in the preamble of the UNESCO Constitution. It uh, elaborate that ignorance. I quote: "Ignorance of each other's ways." and lives has been a common cause of that suspicion and mistrust between peoples of the world through which their differences have all too often broken into war. This is similar to our analysis. Ignorance is the root cause of war and conflict in the preamble of UNESCO Constitution. Ignorance of each other's cultures, civilizations. It brings about, it gives rise to the clutch of civilizations. So what to do? In UNESCO analysis, it goes like this. Our ignorance gives rise to suspicion and mistrust. Mistrust leads to hatred and violence and in war and conflict. So the strategy of the UNESCO is very similar to the Buddhist. War begins in the mind, conflict begins in the mind, so we deal with our mind. What to do then? The UNESCO Constitution concludes that peace, therefore, must be founded upon the intellectual and moral solidarity of mankind. Intellectual and moral solida solidarity of mankind. Then it comes to deal with ignorance. What is the strategy that can eradicate ignorance of man? education. In Buddhism, it's Sikha. For UNESCO, it's education. Now it's our endeavor. Sitaku is a Buddhist academy providing education to their students. My MCU doing that. So how to inculcate wisdom in the minds of the young generation so that we can, prevent, we can prevent conflict and war. Then I, I read the report of the UNESCO in the year 19, brought out in the year 1996, that education which provide the knowledge for academic pursuits and voca vocational training alone and is not enough. So in the report of UNESCO in 1996, its report on education for the 21st century, it said that four components of education must be completed or put together. They are called the four pillars of education. Number one, the purpose of education are fourfold. Number one, learning to know academic pursuit, knowledge of the world, academic uh, excellence, whatever you like to call it. The second one, learning to do, that is 
for vocational purpose, we provide education. And the third pillar is learning to live together, especially in the age of information when the world is so smaller, the conflict, the clash of civilization around history. And number four, learning to be a human being, not a machine in the factory with freedom, happiness, and whatever, a dignity for, for pillars of education. Two years ago, UNESCO office in Bangkok brought out another publication uh, that is a report on the, the third pillar, learning to live together in Asia-Pacific countries. How education in this country train or provide education to the young mind how to live together in peace. And it is quite interesting that they introduced two strategies for education for peace, living together. The third pillar is very important, seems to be very important these days, they say, because of the smaller word, I, as I said. So true strategy can be summarized into two words, two phrases. Number one, discovery of others. And number two, experience of shared purposes. If we want to educate our people in, peace educa uh, in peace, uh, peaceful living, first strategy is provide them with opportunity to discover others. And the second thing, one is not enough. The second strategy is that encourage them to work together with share visions, with share purpose, share goals. In the process of working together, they will, they will learn how to live together in peace. In the first case, discovery of other cultures, other religions. Why not in your university provide knowledge of other religions? For example, in my University Mahajula Lungkorn, we have 25,000 students from BA up to PhD degrees. 70% of 25,000 students are Buddhist monks. We have a department on comparative religion for BA and MA degree. We, send our, we have sent our monk student and professor to learn about, to learn about other religions. I myself and my professor were invited to Egypt, the oldest university of Islam, University of an Azhar to meet with the grand, uh, grand Imam of an Asha. Many times our friends and delegation from Middle East countries come to pay visit to my university and we arrange inter interfaith dialogues with them. I myself was invited to join with the international prayer at the Vatican and happened to be in the same time <laughs> that Mother Janisara was there. Oh, we didn't know that we, are, we were invited together. Assisi, something like that. See? With this spirit of discovery of other cultures, other faiths, the way that Melbourne Janisra invites our friends from other religions here. We expose ourselves 
ทุเลินอาร์ตเคาน์เชอร์ This is discovery of artists for what purpose to eradicate our ignorance or a witcher of art cultures or culture mean way of life of our friends and give rise to tolerance k a n t i tolerance is to be patient with others to live together although in spite of that different we respect them accept them and appreciate their values that is k a n t i tolerance wisdom wisdom with with wisdom come with k a n t i compassion m e t a karuna then what about the the second uh, strategy that is share purpose e x p l a i n of share purpose when we work together we try to ignore our differences try to find similarities comparative, comparative study not not meaning that you emphasize only similarities you try to look into differences the contrast will give the meaning to your faith other faith this is the different okay we preserve our differences but To live together, we have to find similarities, to appreciate, to understand. When work together, we try to find our share vision, our similarity, our same goal. That's why, that's why we can be together and work together for peace. This step. Can be summarized into four strategies of a peace building. In Pali word, we call effort, padana, four padana, or that is four step of strategy for a peace building in the world. There are four kinds of effort for this. The first step is sangvara padana. Effort to prevent conflict and war to arise. That is prevention. The second is pahana badana. When the conflict arises, how to resolve the conflict? The third one, bhavana badana, how to rehabilitate, develop. The minds of the victims of the conflict. How to heal the feeling of the affected, affected parties, to get rid of animosity and hatred, so that we can reach the fourth stage, fourth stage of anurakana badana, effort to preserve peace. As a sustainable stage of development, four stages of peace effort. Number one, I read the question to you all from all the religions: How to prevent conflict? The strategy provided by UNESCO, like a discovery of, of artists, to learn about, to appreciate the differences, to respect identity of the artists. So this stage can be helped by educational institutes in the primary school, secondary school, in the university. Included in the curricula, the faith, culture, practice of other people, so that we can prevent the feeling of suspicion, mistrust, and hatred. This is the first step of strategy: prevention or sangwara badana. 
The second step is Pahana Badana. How to resolve the conflict one needs a life. We have many channels. As a, as a religious uh, friends, followers, and leaders. First, we have to declare loud and clear that we don't allow the conflict. Uh, we don't allow the party in conflict to wage war and start conflict in the name of our religions. No more war in the name of religions. Contain the damage. Because religious sensitivity is easily escalated, instigated. I told you my, our experience in Thailand. No doubt there, was con there has been conflict in the southern part of Thailand. The war of terror is going on there. As a Buddhist reader, we be declare that this is not religious conflict. It is the ambition of political readers locally. They want to gain the political superiority or whatever. They try to draw the conflict into the field of religions. It's a trap for monks, for Muslim leaders there. We won't allow that. So we can contain, we limit, we make a damage Limit to the damage. And let government, as a political leader, to solve the conflict. Not to add the fuel to the fire. And at the same time, we show to the South that we, the Buddhists and the Muslims, in the central part or other parts of the country, can live peacefully as brother and sister. So in my temple, as an abbot of, my, uh, of the temple, we invite the imam, the uh, leader of the Christian church, which I and in our neighbors, to join the ceremony many times. So much that the renovation of the pagoda in my temple has been given the award of excellence by the UNESCO. They cite, in the, 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 the citation, they say, because we gain the temple, gain the support from other community, like the Christians, the Muslims. This is our strategy. And the third one, and the, the, in the second one, to solve the conflict, we have to think of religious diplomacy. The Buddha himself, perform this religious diplomacy when he intervened in the conflict between his relatives, Sakaya and Goliya, because of the water. So he stopped that conflict personally. Monks can do, leaders can intervene in this case. The third one, rehabilitation and development of our minds after the conflict, is that we share our feeling of compassion, charity to uh, console the minds of the lost people and their relatives. Pray together. Meditate, meditation, compassion, whatever it is, to show our concern. But in the long run, the fourth stage, that is Anurakana Badar, how to preserve the peaceful state of our society. There are many factors. And I think uh, the, exp uh, the chair vision, chair experience, chair purposes, 
เข้าตลอด We have to set up organization the international platform to invite the leader of religion to come together and work in solidarity and unity such as this one so this in terms of peace effort it is maybe the first stage prevention of conflict to eradicate our ignorance of each other we learn um, uh, about other culture maybe the first and the last if we continue our effort we gain peace in the world then we have to preserve it call upon this meeting and i will come i support you verbo sir and with this word i just show my solidarity with you and express my full support to your effort verbo most verbo janisla so thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to meet with you all Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, <coughs> most venerable rector of Mahajan Long Gone Raj <coughs> Vidyalaya University. And uh, <coughs> we have noticed uh, main key points in your paper, which the uh, declaration drafting committee is going to study further uh, carefully and incorporate. Um, some of them you know, into the the text. <coughs> uh, before we proceed, there's an exchange of of gifts between the most venerable Chancellor of Sidigu International Buddhist Academy, uh, the most venerable Dr. Ashin Yanisra, and uh, all, and the Rector of Mahajulangon Raj Vitiala University, the most venerable Professor Dr. Ashin Yanisra. Mahajra Langon Rector Siharo, as we call in Burma, is offering the Buddha statue to the Muslim Siddhiku Sala Sahadu, 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 Sahadu. In turn, the most venerable Siddhiku Siharo, the Chancellor of this university, is offering the Siddhiku publication of some of the selected Tripitaka. To the most venerable rector of Mahajula, Long Kong Raj Vidyala University. Sahadu, Sahadu, Sahadu. <coughs> we are indebted to the, the two <coughs> most learned and active and visionary leaders um, for. The wonderful work that is going on here and elsewhere in the world, in the name of um, <coughs> Buddhism. Thank you very much once again, the most venerable rector of Mahajanagar Raj Vidyalaya University, uh, for your leadership, for your vision, and for sharing your time and energy with us today. It means a lot to all of us. Uh, in this hall and beyond. <coughs> After uh, <coughs> we have listened to uh, one of the top scholars and, and visionary leaders of the Buddhist world, the <coughs> most venerable rector of Mahajalong Raj Vitala University, we are going to listen to one of the top Islamic scholars. In the world, <coughs> that is the Chancellor of International University of Religious Studies, this International Religious uh, University, the only one of its kind in the world. Uh, this is from Iran, although it's in the um, Islamic Republic of Iran, it doesn't study only. Um, uh, Islamic studies. Actually, it studies all other religions as well. Today, we have the honor of 
having <clears throat> the chancellor of this unique university, his eminent Ayatollah Sayyid Abu Hassan Nawab, to address us, chancellor. And, and chancellor is a good friend of the most venerable city Gusiaro, and today he is going to be he is going to be speaking to us in Persian. And um, his translator, his uh, translator is H.I. Maulana Sheikh Afan Ali Haidari, the president of Koranwa Alupiat Foundation, Myanmar, and who is also the director of arts and culture, dedicating to interreligious peace. Chancellor. بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم و رحمت الله و برکاته با تشکر از جناب آقای دکتر آشن یعنی سرا و مهمان نوازی گرم مردم و دولت میانمار First and foremost I would like to thanks Dr. Ashin Yanisara for their warm hospitality and kindness. Naqsh adyan dar sulh anfusi wa afaqi. Role of religions in establishing subjective and objective peace. Zist bashar hiç ko khali az nizaa o khushunat nabude az. Hafize ye tarikh faravan biyad darad. که دین دستاورد منازعات و مناقشات فرقی شده است اون چه در این میان تازگی دارد شکیری اقبالی جهانی به گفتگوی ادیان در جهت پیشبرد صلح در عرصه روابط بین الملل است در آستانه قرن 21 دبیر کل وقت سازمان ملل متحد در گرد همایی صلح هزاره و در حضور بیش از هزار نفر از رهبران دینی جهان از انتصاب ناروای خشونت به دین سخن گفت و تأکید کرد که خشونت های به ظاهر دینی اغلب متأثر از منازعات قومی و قبیله است که آتش کشمکش های خونین را برافروخته و دینداران را در برابر یکدیگر قرار داده است این نشست نقطه عطفی در تاریخ معاصر روابط بین الملل بود زیرا نه تنها در پیرا بر پیراستگی دامن دین از خشونت تأکید داشت بلکه دین را به مسابه ابزاری مطمئن برای فرونشاندن در گیری ها معرفی کرد و رهبران دینی را به عنوان عاملان مهم و مؤثری در صلح آفرینی به ویژه در منازعات دینی و فرقی به رسمیت شناخت Man's life has never been free from conflict and violence. History, history is replete with events when religion has been used as an instrument for sectarian conflict and skirmishes. What is new is the global inclination towards interreligious dialogues for promotion of peace in international arena. On the dash of the 21st century, the then UN Secretary General during the Millennium Peace Summit Addressing thousands of religious leaders from across the world spoke of baseless attribution of violence to religion and emphasized that the apparently religious violence is predominantly based on the ethnic and sectarian conflicts that have fanned the flames of bloody skirmishes pitting the faithful against each other. The present session is turning point in the contemporary history of international relations for not only it lays emphasis on the fact that religions have nothing to do with violence but also introduce religion as a secular means for quelling conflict and considering religious leaders as important and effective agents for peacemaking, particularly in religious and sectarian conflicts. تعصب جاهلی و خشونت دینی امروز نیز هستند کسانی که ذات ادیان را خاصگاه خشونت می‌دانند اما ما بر این باوریم که ریشه منازعات دینی را باید در چیزی جستجو کرد که در فرهنگ قرآنی از آن به تعصب و حمیت جاهلی تعبیر می‌شود تعصب جاهلی به معنای جزمندیشی 
و دین ورزی بدون تعقل و به دور از خرد ورزی است که بلای خشونت را به جان دین و دینداران انداخته است Today too, there are some people who consider religion as a bad place of violence, but we believe that the roots of religious conflicts should be traced back in what the Quran calls bigotry or ignorant fantasism. In fact, ignorant fantasism is a bigotry and religious city minus reason which has inflicted the faithful with the calamity of violence. اسلام دینی رحمانی است که روح خرد بر آن جاری است قرآن در صده است تا تبیینی خردپذیر و سلحامیز از خدا انسان و جهان هستی ارائه دهد و به آشکارترین وجهی دینورزی کورکورانه را نف کرده است و تعبد و تعقل و اخلاق را به هم در آمیخته است با این حال شاهد آنیم که رواج قرائت جاهلی از اسلام در پاره از نقاط جهان فجایعی را به نام دین رقم زده است اسلام is a religion of mercy permeated with the spirit of rationality the holy quran offers a rational and peaceful explanation of God, man, and the universe. The Quran clearly rejects blind religiosity considering worship, rationality, and ethics inextricable from each other. Nevertheless, we witness the prevalence of ignorant readings of Islam in some part of the world that have led to catastrophes in the name of religions. Sulhi Jan Sulhi Jahan. در نگرش دینی جان آدمیان به نوبه خود جهانی است که نیازمند صلح است و تا رنگ آرامش نبیند نمیتواند به جهان بیرون خود صلح و آرامش تزریق کند امروز بیش از هر زمان دیگر بایسته است که این آموزه مشترک همه ادیان را با آغوش باز پذیرا شویم که تا وضع و حال درونی و باطنی آدمیان دگرگونی مطلوب نیابد وضع و حال بیرونی و ظاهری آنان دگرگونی مطلوب نخواهد یافت این مضمون در قرآن به این شیک باز تاب یافته است ان الله لا یغیر ما بقوم حتی یغیر ما به انفسهم خداوند آنچه قومی دارند دگرگون نکند مگر آن که آن چه در درون خود دارند دگرگون کنند این ریلیجیس اپروچ هومن سول ایس ا وال این ایتسلف ویچ ریکوایر پیس سو لانگ از دیر ایس نو اینر پیس مین سول کانوت انجت پیس این ترنکولیتی این تو دا اوتا وال تو دی مور دن اینی ادا تایم ایت ایس نسیسیریتی تو دی لایت فولی این اوپنلی امبراز دیس کامون This common teaching of all religions for unless the inner condition of human beings are not changed desirably, their outer condition would not be changed desirably. This theme has been reflected in the following verses of the Holy Quran. Allah does not change what is in its nation unless they change what is in themselves. Guftugu ye adyan wa sul hafarini. فراز پایانی نوشتار حاضر تأکید بر رسالتی است که گفتگوی ادیان در جهت سلحافرینی بر عهده دارد تا قرن بیستم مواجهه بین ادیان را عمدتا نزدیکی مکانی و فراز و فرود قلم رو رقم میزد اما در شرایط کنونی که روزگار جهانی شدن است گفتگوها چه بسا با در نوردیدن مرزهای سرزمینی و ایدئولوژیک به واقعیت جاری اصل ما تبدیل شده اند. گرچه با توجه به تاریخ دور و دراز ادیان تجربه گفتگوی حقیقی یا مواجهه سازنده بین ادیان هنوز دوران تفولیت خود را تیمی کند. The concluding part of this paper focus on the mission that in the religious shoulders in promoting peace Until 20th century, interreligious encounter was mainly based on geographical and territorial proximity. But today, at the time of globalization, dialogue has gone beyond territorial and ideological boundaries and has turned it to a reality of our era. 
However, in the light of the long history of religion, the experience of interreligious dialogue is still in the embryonic, embryonic stage of its development. ادیان به مرگ و زندگی پیروان معنا می بخشند و زبان و نماد تفسیر واقعیت و مرهم آلام بشر را در اختیار دارند. به همین دلیل این ظرفیت و توانایی را دارند که بیش از هر عنصر دیگر توده ها را بسیج و همراه کنند این سرمایه عظیمی است که رهبران ادیان باید برای استقرار صلح و خرد از آن بهره گیرند و حال که برخلاف گذشته قدرت صلح آفرینی ادیان به رسمیت شناخته شده ضرورت گفتگوی ادیان برای تحقق صلح بیش از هر زمان دیگری احساس می شود کمترین برونداد این گفتگوها شهادت بر این واقعیت است که خشونت دینی فراورده ذاتی ادیان نیست بلکه پیامد شوم امتزاج تعصب و جمود با دینداری است religions give meaning to the lives of the faithful religions also possess the language symbol of interpretation of the reality and the balm to the pains of human beings due to this very reason more than any other element they possess they possess the capacity and ability to mobilize the masses this is a great asset that should be utilized by the religious leaders for the establishment of peace and rationality Today, contrary to the past, the peacemaking power of religious is recognized. Hence, the necessity of interreligious dialogue for realization of peace is more than any other felt urgently. The least output of such dialogue is bearing witness to the fact that the religious violence is not essentially a religious product, but the ominous consequence of dovetailing of bigotry and ossification with the religious city. Excuse me, a Thank few points about my university. Uh, I am the president of University of Religion in Iran. This university is non-governmental uh, university. We have only high education study. We have more than 600 students at PhD. The University of the Religion and the Dimination has he teaching all of the religion and the dimination, all of the religions, Islam, Jewish, Buddhist, Christian, uh, Hindu, all of the Chinese, Shinto, all of the religion and demonization in the world. This is the first and the last university, this kind of university in the world. And we have only this the academic tradition. We no going, no telling bad or no good about the Adyan. Only academic tradition. It is only academic tradition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chancellor of International Regents University of Iran, Ayatollah Sayyid Abu Hassan Nawab. Um, I myself have never met Ayatollah before, learned Islamic scholar, and it's an honor today to meet um, Ayatollah Chancellor of Regis University from Iran. Um, before we move on with the uh, speakers from Latin America, uh, I would like to call on uh, Mr. Fatim, um, Palin, Palianskin, Palianskin, the chairman of the Russian Jewish Association to address the conference. We have heard from the 
uh, Hindu speakers, the Islamic speakers, the Christian speakers, now is the Jewish speaker. Thank you. Distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, colleagues, I would like to welcome you and I would like to thank uh, Sayadaw Ashin Yanisara for the invitation for, this, for the invitation to this conference for the opportunity to see this excellent country to communicate with all of you to see beautiful cities of Myanmar Pagodas. Thank you very much. I represent Jewish society in Russia. Uh, St. Petersburg city. I would like to stress that Jewish people are for peace. Мы, как никто другие, знаем цену мира. Jewish people, maybe like no one else, know the price of peace. Только во Второй мировой войне, only the Second World War, еврейский народ заплатил огромную цену. Has uh, taken millions of life. Миллионы невинных людей. A very huge, people. very huge price. Община Макаби, которую я представляю. Макаби комьюнити, Jewish society, which I represent, уже почти 30 лет, for more than 30 years, организовывает, organize, проводит, held, межнациональные и межконфессиональные различные мероприятия, different international, inter, uh, inter-ethnic, multi-ethnic events. Это и спортивные мини-олимпийские игры. Like sports, mini-olympic games. Это культурные мероприятия. Cultural events. Это фестивали фольклорные и современные. Uh, modern and traditional festivals of culture. Образовательные программы, это семинары и круглые столы. Educational programs, uh, round table discussions. Детские и семейные лагеря летние. Uh, different summer camps for families and for children. Где представители всех диаспор и конфессий между собой общаются и дружат. Where people from different religions and different communities and societies are all together in peace. Вот это реальная работа. This is a real step for peace. Но это на региональном уровне в Санкт-Петербурге. Nowadays we do it on a regional level in St. Petersburg in Russia. Особенно у нас очень близкие отношения с буддистами Санкт-Петербурга. We have especially close friendship with Buddhists of St. Petersburg. Я хотел поздравить всех буддистов то, что у нас в Санкт-Петербурге было только что отметили 100 лет Датсану. Uh, we have just celebrated 100 years anniversary of St. Petersburg Datsan. И нашего ламу Буду Бадмаевича, Баджиевича, Буду Баджиевича, который один из самых активных религиозных деятелей Санкт-Петербурга принимает активное участие в межнациональных наших делах. And uh, Buddhist leaders of St. Petersburg take, take active part in our events. Но мы предлагаем Как можно больше проводить мероприятия уже более глобального масштаба, мирового? We propose to, uh, to, ha to hold as many events of cultural and uh, multi-ethnic multi character as possible. Чтобы представители всех конфессий, религий, национальностей 
so that representatives of different nations, uh, religions, nationalities могли приезжать друг другу в гости can visit each other семьями with their families maybe обмены детьми студентами with their children with their students чтобы общались между собой просто даже кушали даже вот еду одну это очень важно so that they communicate and even share foods which is very important вот это будет шаг к миру this can be a step to peace и хотел бы закончить свое выступление I would like to finish my speech словами with the words из молитвы о мире from Jewish prayer for peace великого еврейского цадика Рэба Нахмана из Браслова one of the greatest Jewish rabbis да не поднимет народ на народ меча и не будут больше учиться воевать. Will not one nation lift up swords against another nation, and will not one learn war? Эти слова написаны на памятнике в учебнике. These words are written at a statue. Перекуем мечи на орала во дворе в парке ООН в Нью-Йорке. In front of the United Nations building in New York. Я вас всех очень люблю. I love all of you. И я сегодня специально делал форму сборной Олимпийской России. I have I am I am in the Russian national sports символически team. Так как я патриот своей страны России. As I am also very patriotic to my country. Тренер, учитель. I'm also a sport trainer and teacher. Под judo. In judo. У меня много детей очень занимается разных национальностей и разных вероисповеданий. I have very many students of different nations and different religions. И я их учу с самого маленького детства уважать друг друга и любить друг друга. And since their childhood, I teach them to love each other and to know each other. Большое вам спасибо. Мир вам. Thank you. Be in peace. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Vadim Polinskin. Thank you very much for your speech. Thank you. And uh, <clears throat> you can see the message of peace from the different spectrums of um, uh, various faiths. Uh, <coughs> being is present in those at this conference, and um, at the end of each speech, just like the Buddhist speech, the whether it's a Catholic and an Islamic, a Hindu, a Jewish, you know, we all say sadhu, sadhu three times. Sadhu is well done the way we uh, respect the Buddhist teaching. And uh, this morning, now, uh, before we move on, I also would like to thank the translator, uh, Dr. Dmitry Kavalenko, who is pro-rector of the National Research University of Electronic Technology in Moscow. Um, as I have already informed the conference, this morning, we will be listening to our colleagues from Latin America and <clears throat> taking over the responsibility of MC is my colleague, Venerable Okam Lankara uh, from Sidigu International Buddhist Academy. He has a master in Buddhist studies as well as in library science and uh, from Hawaii University. So uh, he, he, he will be looking after the uh, coming speakers from Latin America. Fernando Ockham's. Good morning, everyone. And thank you very much, Venerable Professor Do Dr. Dabasami, for your nice introduction. 
and it's my honor to be assisting you in moderating the morning session. My job today is, this morning, is to take you back to where we started Latin America. And I would also like to request our speaker, your cooperation, to limit your speech within 10 minutes. <clears throat> and we all know that you have come a long way from Latin America, and we know that you have so many things to share with us, but due to our time constraint, I'd like to request your cooperation. Now I'd like to start with Mr. Randy Gracia Galando from Mexico. His topic of the presentation is on Buddhism, a solution to the degradation of the Mexican society. Mr. Randy Gracia Galando, please. Good morning, most venerable, most venerable Ashin Nyanisara, ladies and gentlemen. Buddhism, a solution to the degradation of Mexican society. Mexico is a multicultural, multi-ethnic country embedded in a pre-Hispanic Catholic tradition, a mixture of different cultures so that the social, economic, and political problems have always been very complex. However, in recent years, there is a clear exacerbation of violence, corruption, and impunity. These situations does not seem to improve. On the contrary, it is worsening day by day. Just read or listen to the news, and you would often be in form of kidnapping, beheading, mass murder, influence paddling, human trafficking, drug related with violence and corruption. The list of the, of the maladies is long. In this situation, that is about the 50% 50, 50 of the population and inadequate education of most Mexicans. How did Mexico get to this lowest point? How long have we been suffering from this ethical degradation? To answer this question, we must embark on the journey to the past and understand what Mexicans are today. It's the result of a violent history, As starting from what has been called the conquest, continuing with the colonial period, and the independence and the Mexican Revolution. Each of these period has something, has shaped the country that today we call Mexico. Has a common denominator, violence. The first two moments that the conquest and the colonial period have in common of being an expect eruption which broke the fragile balance of society and imposed an oppressing and consciousness numbing cultural patterns such as a foreign religion. Now, I will briefly explain each of these historical period to better understand the different problem of as it was said, Mexico is a country with an old history. Dating more than 3,000 years, the origin of great civilization, such as the Olmecs, Mayans, and Aztecs, which reached a high degree of social, political, economic, and military development. The conquest. It is a historical period from 1519 to 1521, when Spain conquered and subjugated the Aztec Empire, which occupied what now a days is Mexico. The conquest is a meeting of two worlds, two worlds view, two great civilizations, 
to divergent way of interpreting their own realities. However, both have something in common, a deep religious sense. The great city of Mexico, Tenochtitlan, succumbed to the Spanish conqueror, who with an iron hand attempted to erase the glory of people forged by warm and wisdom, imposing a new religion and a new language. The Spaniard found in Mexico not only a loose geography, but also a new history, a history that is still alive. It is not past, but present. Although pre-Columbian Mexican with its temple and God, which now is a heap of ruins, seems to be dead. The spirit that animates this ancient world is still alive in the consciousness of Mexicans. The conquest was marked by the systematic use of violence, the abuses of authority by powerful invaders, a habit which has not yet disappeared in the government elite, and the, religion, and the resignation of the people nowadays more visible than ever. In this way, this new country was built over pyramids of corpses and abuses. The colony and the independence. The colony period extends from the end of, of the Spanish conquest in 1521 until the independence of Mexico, 1810. During this period, it, was, it began what is called miscegenation, that is the mixture between the conquerors and the conqueror, a combination that defined the current character of the Mexican nation. To fully understand the complexity of this, the colonial times, we should mention that two types of Spanish domination. First, military conquest, and second, spiritual conquest. Regarding the spiritual conquest, it brought a new moral code and a culture, which in turn caused desperate loss of identity. When the independence came in 1810, there has been about three centuries of plundering, and a new culture has been established, Hispanic culture. The Mexican Revolution. The Mexican Revolution from 1910 to 1920, unlike other revolution of the 20th centuries, was not so much the expression of more or less utopian ideology, but the explosion of an oppressed historical and social reality. It was not the struggle of a group of ideologies determined to implement just principles, but a popular oppression which revealed all the corruption that was hidden. Therefore, it was more a revelation than a revolution. Although the revolution transformed Mexican society in many ways, unfortunately, it didn't solve the social or economical problem of Mexico. Mexico of today, after the revolution until the year 2000, Mexico was ruled by only one political party, the Institutional Revolution, Revolutionary Party. This unique event of having one political party ruling Mexico more for a, more, about 70 years has been called the perfect dictatorship because the ability of this political, political party to endure governing for so long under the simulation of a democracy. Mexico today is a semi-failed state. That is a state that where 
the institution do, does not function to serve the citizen needs. An example of this is that 99% of crimes committed in Mexico go unpunished. Justice has, been, has become a bargaining chip. Mexico is a state where, which its characteristics mark are impunity, corruption, and drug addiction, drug trafficking. On top of this, about 50% of the population live in a state of poverty. Fear is a state religion. Through kidnapping, torture, extortion, and forced disappearances, the monopoly of power is asserted. A clear example of this is the disappearance of the 43 students from Ayotzinapa in September of 2014 in front of the eye of Mexican society and the world. In Mexico today, I do not see a nation, but a harassed citizens. I do not see rule of law, but a narco state. I do not see state agency serving, serving Mexicans, but a public servant violating human rights. I do not see wealth for the common good, but privilege for a few. I do not see politicians at the service of citizens, but moral degradation. From the stand, uh, standpoint of Dama, my country has a terrible problem. It is about ethic. That is, ethics does not seem to exist. The imbalance between the institution and citizens regarding their rights and obligations is increasingly conspicuous as it, the inequality in the distribution of wealth and the lack of opportunity in education and health care, the lack of employment for everybody, and the user inefficiency in the delivery of justice, which conduce to all kinds of ethical transgression. This ethical problem unprecedented in our recent history is devastating Mexico. Yet we live in a lastly country, in a Catholic country, where 83% the population profess this religion. From the, my perspective, the Catholic religion has failed in its task of giving ethical support to its followers and the nation. In fact, some of its religious leaders have been involved in serious ethical lapses of various kinds. At this time, where the degradation of Mexican society has touched unprecedented extreme, the good news is that the Buddha Dhamma has arrived. Nowadays, in Mexico, there are Buddhist centers belonging to all major traditions, Theravada, Mahayana, and Baharayana. The Regarding to our tradition, Theravada, the Dhamma seed has been planted in, Dhamma, in the Dhamma Vihara, the first Theravada monastery in speaking Spanish country, founded in 1999 by the late Venerable Usilananda and my teacher, Venerable Bhikkhu Nandisena with the invaluable help of Rosa Maria Martinez and the late Dr. Alejandro Cordova Cordova. The Dama in Mexico is emerging as the lotus flower. It is being born in the midst of violence and corruption, pain and injustice. I'm convinced that this is the most suitable time to spread this teaching of Buddha. 
I was born and raised in a Catholic country, and therefore in a Catholic family, in different cultures, geographically distant from the place of origin of Buddhism, and chronologically far away from the time of Buddha. The society with, to which I belong does not teach compassion, loving kindness, sympathetic joy, nor generosity. If these singly universal ideas are difficult to understand to my society, how much more difficult they are to practice in every life, especially in this time full of violence and corruption. In fact, they are foreign concepts. However, for us practitioners of Buddhism in emerging countries, it takes time and effort to learn and implement them. Despite of all of this, I have myself experienced the benefit of Dhamma and I could see how great it can be to people like me. I have been fortunate to accompany some people in meditative process at the Dhamma Vihara. Some of them are desperate with a, with a strong desire to alleviate the suffering through the practice of meditation and learning the Buddha Dhamma. For some time, I have been living and working as a volunteer at the Dhamma Vihara. I have, been, I have had the opportunity to hear and understand some meditator experiences. These experiences have, have helped me to comprehend the great potential of Buddha Dhamma and, and judge the benefit that the teaching will bring to a society so ethically degraded as the Mexican. As I mentioned before, in the midst of this crisis, when the official religion has failed, when Mexicans are devoid of ethical values, immersed in drug addiction, afflicted by poverty, without decent jobs, and without social and political peace, the, this is the proper time to spread the, the, with more effort the Buddha Dhamma and solution to these sicknesses. Let the, the Dhamma Vihara be for a long time a place where the Buddha's teaching of peace and liberation are preserved and spread faithfully to the Spanish-speaking world. Let us give peace a chance in Mexico. May the Buddha Dhamma reach many more people as the Buddhism spread in the East, so it can also be spread in my country and through all Latin America, cool, uh, cultural and geographically different for our uh, Latin America. Although cultural and geographically difference are considerable, many people are already receiving the teaching and benefiting from it, from it regaining their inner peace, reconnecting with their emotion, and re returning to more a moral code that allows them to live in harmony with the environment. Peace, do not, peace, peace does not arise from peace, but from an entrail of conflict and violence. The road is already mapped. How can we continue to expand the teaching? The ministry of the Buddha lasted 45 years, teaching people with different beliefs, different ethnicities, spreading his philosophy of non-violence and liberation. I think this is the appropriate path that Mexicans should follow learning and spreading the Buddha Dhamma with persistence and determination, as the Buddha himself did it in the past. Today, there is a hope for peace by transmitting the teaching in different ways, using traditional methods or modern technology. More Mexicans will have the opportunity to come and into contact with the teaching and building a better relationship with ourselves and the environment. The Dhamma has come from far away, like the conquerors in the past, but un unlike him, the weapons now are not sharp iron, but peace and freedom. Let the Dhamma conquer Mexico. Thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> sorry, sorry.
Thank you, Mr. Rene Gracia Galindo. Muchas gracias for your presentation and sharing the history that the Mexican society has gone through rather unpleasant. And we very much appreciate for seeing Buddhism as a solution. Next, I'd like to call up Reverend Zhang Gong Sagya from Colombia. And his topic of the presentation is in Spanish, and I'm trying to read it. If comunidades aprendiendas de paz una apuesta desde eso. And that's I. <laughs> Good morning. Um, uh, excuse me, English. Learned communities for peace. A proposal from the shows. Gratitude. I want to thank my gratitude to teach Hispanic Institute of Buddhist Studies, Habit Venerable Bhikkhu Nandisena. He is time for the degrees, the organizers on the World Buddhist Conference for peace, tuping the possibility of entering ISO's fundamental ISO's and always good made possible this important moment. I would exit a session be will happy and free from suffering. Poem You, my and woman, near beats of angusty. Be observing odd violence, answer you, you, you destroy it. You bling, bling, you keep thinking, feeling, watching, at will destroy it. For you, for me, love, be you not did apparent, look, and the sweet surprises of light, is interconnected I from out you. Peace Colombia. Girl Colombia. Natural Center of Historical Memory Bidwit in the concept on the armed conflict where under large people have been killed. Armies in public had been displaced. Learning communities Four pins a proposito from the suit. Principles of peace education. 
Pipeline and the process of continuous learning. It is necessary to deconstruct and strengthen violence mechanisms that operate with use and which are found by the culture of violence. Recognize and respect local contexts. Have the global local you and the problem. Sitting at it, listening it com passion, listening. Some principles of learning communities for peace. Do might this possibility is necessary to root our symbol it. Despite too long period, the prongs create common unity. You this common unity must endorse from diversity because because whole people people are different and the one did failing and existing. The trampling axis of learning the share for peace. This peace does not need so underdones on practice it among human beings. It must be life from you ecological perspective. Should link to transform this mechanism all culture the strength, the boot, the violent paradigm. The human diversity is an problem that is a possibility. Activity, participation of women, fundamental, important. Conversation, new girls. Basis of cooperation. The movies were self organized. Basis of compassion for all base. Confidence, critical thinking. Thank you. Thank you, opportunity. Thank you, Reverend Sang Kong Sakya, for sharing the principles of learning communities for peace and uh, highlighting the importance of recognizing and respecting the local context in peace process. Now I'd like to call upon Mr. Winston Velasco, the president of Instituto, Instituto de Estudios Budista Hispano from Venezuela. His topic of the presentation is is peace possible in times of crisis? Thank you. Thank you. Most venerables. Most venerables of the Sangha. Venerables, distinguished guests, friends, in Dhamma. Thank you for venerable Nyanasara for inviting uh, me in this opportunity and uh, I think this is a remarkable um, moment where uh, so many uh, representatives from Latin America are here and uh, I want to read at this moment because the time is very short but I think they add a value that I can uh, give you uh, for me being here is to try to picture 
um, situation in that part of the world that is totally different from probably what you used to see in this part of the world. The history of uh, Venezuela is not much different from Mexico that uh, we have uh, uh, listened, very uh, nice uh, presentation. And just to resume in a, in a short way, uh, we have been in a process, uh, just to make a long story short, we have been in a process that uh, the last 15 years have been uh, conducted by a, a political situation, maybe you have read the news, where all the institutions have been driven by only one idea. Set aside, step aside, all different views. And in my perspective, in my understanding of this process, uh, it seems that the human mind works that when you have too much control, too much power, um, you start developing a huge ego and things move like myself and others. You are with me or you are against me. Then you, you will develop enemies everywhere. So the, the just the core um, people that controls the big decisions in a country uh, are driven by, the, by this ideology, which underline, the, the underlying uh, idea is just to maintain uh, power, maintain control, then this ideology, and happens in many other countries, develop in poverty, corruption, scarcity. Uh, you can see the news, and uh, such a rich country, such a resourceful country, like Venezuela, for example, is now going through a very sad condition of poverty, crime, and so on. Venezuela now is a country that at least 40 people die every weekend. A country where you cannot go out in the street and talk by phone because most probably you will get robbed. Uh, sometimes even a shoes is more valuable than a life. Uh, so in this environment, and you, I can uh, uh, try to invite you to to imagine sitting in a desk and trying to, to write something about peace. It is very difficult. It is very difficult. But, but, uh, things change. The, 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 um, the political situation is something that governed the country, okay? And now I'm talking about just a country because thinking about global peace is even more difficult being in a, in a, in, in, involved in this uh, environment. We all know, I, I won't uh, tell any uh, technical uh, issues about buildings because we all know that, uh, for example, my point of, from my point of view, Buildings will bring definitely easy on problems. Buildings will develop, definitely solve the problem. Yesterday we were talking about uh, Panchasila, we were talking about uh, all the technical stuff that definitely will clean, will purify the mind, will bring peace. Definitely. Buddhist is a way, is a way without doubt of founding peace. I would like to define peace as the absence of conflict. Okay? And yesterday we were talking also about conflict as an individual or as a country or as a war. 
the absence of conflict will be peace. And Buddhism is about that. It's about reaching a state without conflict, because conflict it generates from defilements, the mental defilements. We have talked about that. So taking eradicating mental defilements will become the solution. Now the thing is how, because nowadays the things they are, I really don't see much how um, we can introduce uh, these ideas to political uh, levels. But now I think the key, as was mentioned before by Venerable Hansa also, education. I think education for the next generation is a way of starting making change in society. Secularism in Buddhism, I think, will be uh, the huge solution. Now we have to find out practical ways to do that because also we have mentioned that we have to be active. Uh, just to sit down and see and watch how the world move and, and, and you know, just accepting probably won't do much. So, in our perspective, or my, my perspective in this moment, as a president of the Hispanic Institute of Buddhist Studies, we are planning to make programs of uh, ethical, practical ethical programs to be introduced, to try to be introduced in society as pol uh, public or private uh, institutions um, in a level that people can experience ethic. Because in the Western world, I think most of the people is now stepping away from, from faith. People is more willing to experience. And Buddhism is a religion of experience. Faith is, is not the uh, the strongest point in Buddhism, experience, meditation, have a vast knowledge on how to work in the path of peace, trying to diminish the defilement, trying to eradicate the defilement, but then how to do that? So I, I think the way is practical is to, do, to make programs that can be introduced into society and managing Buddhist values as generosity, as all the uh, precepts and, and many others. That there are suttas of the Buddha that can be example, of, of course, of uh, ethical life. The Buddha, uh, in my understanding, he spent a lot of time talking about ethics, not with this word, but we can understand it now, nowadays, it was ethic. So, that's in a broad view. In a broad view, it's just education in a practical way, making programs that people can feel, can interact with the experience of ethic. And then, from them, people will start uh, influencing others. So it's like a, like a wave, okay? Probably this is a, a naive uh, idea, probably it's idealistic, uh, and it's, of course it's not the big solution. I know interreligious dialogues is important. I think interreligious inter -religious dialogues are more important in, in a way of try to find common grounds on how to make programs, active programs, uh, to help people understand the ethical life. Because we don't do anything if, if we just uh, preach 
our religion or Catholics or Jewish or any religion, just trying to convince people that uh, what we do is, is good. Why is good? And then the interreligious dialogues will help. If we can get common grounds to make people understand that ethical life is important. In the Western world, if you say ethical life is important, always will come the question, why? Western people ask themselves everything. To be, to, to, to uh, try to uh, impose any phase, well, we have seen what is, what is going through. The situation in Latin America is really difficult because to introduce Buddhism, imagine a country that the concept of generosity do not exist. But what, is, uh, what exists is pretty much the concept of pity and uh, is managed by several religions. And with, almost without resource, you have to try to introduce Buddhist values. So my, my, to end it up, practical programs, education, and of course, the most important peace that it can be found is inner peace, is individual peace, and Buddhist knows very well how to find it. But to help others, we need practical programs where people can uh, benefit from Buddhist values. Um, thank you very much. This is all I want to share with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Winston Velasco, for sharing with us the history of Venezuela and highlighting the vitality of the right to education to, to eradicate the defilement, preventing us from experiencing peace. Our next speaker is from Spain, the president of the Association Hispana Budismo, Mr. Ricardo Guerrero. His topic of the presentation is the ethical responsibility of media to peace. Good morning, buenos dias. Most Venerable Rector Hashin Yanisara, thank you very much for inviting me. Venerables, brothers and sisters in the Dharma, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. When I was younger, I worked as a TV director, and uh, in 1991, the Spanish radio and television sent me to Kuwait to cover the war of the Gulf. So I had the possibility to see very, very closely what uh, really is a war. So as a Buddhist and uh, as a professional of communication, I would like to speak about uh, the ethical responsibility of media to peace. While violence is a phenomenon inherent to both the human beings and the development of civilization dating back to the beginning of time, since some decades ago, as of the development and the increasingly important role played by social media, the perception the individual has of violence has substantially changed, making of social unrest and human suffering a phenomenon present in our daily lives and that we are in great danger of getting used. The problem of human suffering as the axis on which it is built, the philosophical corpus of the Dhamma, has been studied by the most famous 
personalities and scholars of Buddhist thought since the time of the Buddha himself to this day, which has generated a rich literature that sheds enough light on the origin, causes, evolution, and consequences of human violence, both for the individual and for the society as a whole. Communication as inherent activity to the intellectual development and as essential element for the formation and functioning of human societies occupies a central place in the scheme of social studies. All human behavior is conceived relationally and represents a form of communication. Man cannot stop acting. There is nothing involving the non-conduct so that everything in man any activity or lack of activity, any word or absence of speech, becomes communication. The same Buddhist path recognizes its specific importance, reflecting in referring to the right speech, the human activity that, though not exclusively, refers to the most obvious expression of the communication. The media, as social level equivalence of human activity to communicate, should require our utmost attention because in their development have become broadcast channels for news, information and views with ability to configure the universe of attitudes, values and judgments about the political, economic and cultural context in which we live. Since the early development of media as we know them today, the events related to the violence have been the source and object's information to the point of becoming one of the most important journalistic genres. For this reason, the various media have a high responsibility to society as a whole. They are the ones in charge to report the truth of what is happening. And this responsibility is ethical in nature because it is also recognized in the media the role of guiding public opinion, a goal that would be achieved if the necessary information were provided to the viewers in order them to come to have their own point of view on the various events. We Buddhists know very well the value of the analysis based on the own experience. The Buddha himself, referring to his own teaching, advised us that one should not accept it blindly, but investigate their meaning and try to understand the truth by oneself. To talk of ethics in the media, we have to keep in mind that the information cannot exist without a reporter and that the reporter is dual, made by journalist and the company or institution owner of the medium. The communicator cannot be detached from his point of view or more importantly, from his moral conscience. Regarding the company, only the true independence of the media can ensure that the information only responds to purely informational criteria. The main guidelines to be followed by the media to fulfill its function of informing the society are objectivity, accuracy, timeliness, and plurality. When these criteria are not present in the information at hand, they are breaking both the right the citizens have to receive objective information and their journalistic ethics. In recent decades, we have witnessed how the traditional media have been integrated into large business groups with interests in the areas of finance and industry globally. This makes that concepts and ideals as pluralism, independence, and free press are relegated to only one condition, marked by economic power. They move for their own benefit and therefore they express the opinions that suit them. The interests that are played today are so important that they are above the purely informative journalistic principles before the permissiveness and resignation of citizens. 
The emergence of new digital media has been a breath of fresh air in this respect. Now anyone can post or comment without no more limits but those marked by the freedom of expression itself. No major investments are needed, no grants or licenses, so that we are witnessing a shift in advertising investments towards unconventional media. Thanks to the internet, we have a range of sources of information and documentation as never before in the history of mankind. But technology in itself does not solve all problems. Even though the fact can provide a greater commitment to the principles of independence and objectivity, it also involves the appearance of new sources uncontrollably and outside the criteria on information quality. Every person receiving information can also become a transmitter of information. Today, we find many sources of information as well as disinformation. As for the information professionals, they should know how to provide the audience with information certain and objective, and confining themselves to record reality starkly. In addition, they must know how to distinguish between information and propaganda, between describing and interpreting events. They should also evaluate how far the professional detachment comes regarding the events they are covering and when they begin to treat the individuals in an indifferent and dehumanized way. But besides professional quality and independence of information, there is a particularly important aspect regarding the media and its responsibility for the maintenance of peace. One aspect that lies in the perspective and position before violence. The reporter who covers armed conflicts, war journalism, usually informs on events with a language that doesn't provide the society with the opportunities to solve disputes with alternative ways to violence. In this sense, he becomes a passive element, a simple witness of the horror located outside the events. Ethical responsibility should go beyond the quality and independence of information. The word journalism has to become peace journalism, a way of informing on events related to violent conflicts that emphasizes the non-violent ways in which society responds to contexts of violence. Among the features of this type of information, we can highlight to explore the root causes of conflicts. Unlike war journalism, not to analyze confrontations in terms of winners and losers, violence degrades both the assailant as the victim. To provide visibility and try to humanize all actors in the conflict, each one with the role and moral responsibility where it belongs. To change the role of neutral witness of violence into actor with capacity to intervene and prevent it. In short, news media have the ability to choosing the point of view, to taking an active ethical position and to clarifying as far as possible the nature of the conflict. But they also have a responsibility to help resolving it by providing with the necessary information to get the knowledge that enables a subsequent deep analysis of reality and thus the creation of an opinion state conducive to the peaceful resolution of conflicts. I would like to conclude this brief paper with a quote from Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi about the responsibility not of the communicators only, but of all people in relation to world peace. As private individuals, we cannot hope to resolve by our will the larger patterns of conflict that engulf the societies and nations to which we belong. We live in a world that thrives on conflict, and in which the forces that nurture conflict are pervasive, obstinate, and terribly powerful. But as followers of the enlightened one, what we can do and must do is to testify by our conduct to the supremacy of peace, 
to avoid words and actions that engender animosity, to heal divisions, to demonstrate the value of harmony and concord. The model we must emulate is that provided by the master in his description of the true discipline. He is one who unites the divided, who promotes friendships, enjoys concord, rejoices in concord, delights in concord, and who speaks words that promote concord. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ricardo Guerrero. You, your, your presentation is very excellent, and thanks for pointing out the responsibility of media and spreading the news, and for asking the media to act as a medium in peace building, rather than just spreading the false news or unfruitful news. Now I would like to call up Mr. Ricardo Sasaki from Brazil, Nalanda Institute. His presentation is on the role of peace for the growing of a nation. Twelve years ago, I had the honor to be invited to the historic event of World Buddhist Summit held in December 2004 in the Mahapasana Cave in Yangon, uh, Myanmar. Hundreds of Buddhist leaders coming from all around the world came together to share knowledge, know more deeply each other, and celebrate peace. At that time, I have mentioned in my goodwill message that, open quote, generation after generation, eminent Sayadors and their lay supporters have kept the light of Dhamma brightening this land and generously shared the light of Dhamma with the people of the entire world, end quote. I'm happy to see that many years have passed, but the determination to work for peace has not faded. And once again, we are coming together for peace. The whole world needs peace, and also the Buddhist people need peace. Greed, hatred, and ignorance are all around, and we must be strong and united in our commitment to wisdom, compassion, and peaceful living. Once again, Sitago Soyado and his International Buddhist Academy takes the lead in supporting this important reunion. It's truly a delight to participate and get together in the name of peace. As my paper is one of the longest of this conference, and you can read it in the book afterwards, so I will try to do my best to be short and to the point. The synthesis of my paper, that is called The Role of Peace for the Growing of a Nation, is that in the same way all living beings have a drive to grow and develop new possibilities, also nations that in fact are communities of human beings have a drive to develop, to grow. However, in this conditioned world, energy, time, and the space are limited and any nation has to choose what aspects it will develop. We are limited beings living in limited conditions. We cannot grow and develop everything all the time, everywhere. You can choose to study a few main subjects during your life, but you cannot study everything and know them well. The difference among nations comes about by what they choose to develop along their histories. The power in choice is that nations and human beings can, take, can make these choices all the time, anywhere, anytime. You decide to stop eating junk in food, you decide actively help other people, you decide to start doing exercise, you decide to really study the words of the Buddha, 
or not. You can also choose to live a, meaningful, a meaningless life, watch TV and YouTube videos all day, and eat all you can manage. As a nation, decisions are made in the direction of peace or into the growing through greed and territorial conquests. To invest heavily in education or health or, on the other direction, spend its energies in media manipulation, stimulating its people to enjoy the sense pleasures or creating imaginary enemies somewhere. We choose all the time little tiny changes that become habits, and these decisions shape our future. Let's take, for example, the choice of war and violence. Many Asian societies in the ancient times have developed through war. They are not different from Western societies. Many also have suffered due to the 19th century colonizations by the Western powers, in the name of commerce and free trade, colonizing powers permitted the artificial immigration of foreign populations, disrupting indigenous societies. Immigrants offered cheap labor, creating sometimes unfair competition. But immigrants also strived hard in their work with the need of survival pressing them. While bringing some stress due to their different background, on the other side, immigrants also bring new ideas and a creative power from their own native cultures. As the world becomes more and more global, it's impossible to absolutely stop the transit of people and good, goods among nations. In a sense, we are all immigrants. A balance among the various peoples and races and religions within a nation and throughout the world is an art requiring skill, intelligence and compassion. The Buddha was an uh, advocate of development by peaceful means. In his counsel to King Ajatasattu in the famous Mahaparinibbana Sutta, some of the principles he laid down for social stability were that people, open quote, meet in harmony, carry on their business in harmony, do not fall prey to the craving, end quote. The Buddha was also a defender of plurality. In his Sangha, he accepted any individual willing to make effort for the spiritual goal. No race, cultural background, sex, economical or social status was an obstacle. The merit comes from the effort, from willingness to do good and to do well. These are the criteria for the goodness of men and women. If we ought to follow the example of the Buddha, our choices will be in the direction of development by peaceful means and plurality. But how one takes this decision? How, what can be the motivating force behind compassion? One does this remembering how much suffering the alternative generates. One does this remembering and reflecting deeply the following words of the Buddha. Open quote, and thus have you long undergone suffering, undergone torment, undergone misfortune, and fill the graveyards full, truly long enough to be dissatisfied with all the forms of existence, long enough to turn away and free yourselves from them all. This is Samyutta Nikaya. Yes, beings have been suffering for too long. Why do you want to add to the suffering? Why a human being or a nation would truly want to be an agent of suffering in this world. But let's be clear about what is peace. Before any discussion about the role of peace, we must be clear what peace means. According to Buddhist doctrine, there is a relative and conditional peace and a true and unconditional peace. No amount of effort can extinguish suffering in this world. 
nor implement ways that are absolutely just, peaceful and permanent. We live in samsara, wandering from here to there, moved by greed, hatred and confusion, and to expect a complete and permanent peace in this world is an utopia. So when we speak of peace, we, we mean two kinds, though interconnected ones. We mean that we must strive for a peaceful situation in the world, endeavoring to do our best to secure maximum peace in our societies and nations, while maintaining equanimity regarding our failures and adverse conditions in the world. All this while keeping in mind that true peace can only be achieved completely inside us, through virtue and inside cultivation. Uh, if you want to, to know more about how, how the Buddha explained the whole arising of uh, conflict, uh, read my paper. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ricardo Sasaki. We just have one more speaker and I'd like to request our venerable sir and participants to stay with me for a while before we break up for lunch. Now I would like to call upon Mr. Laudaro Eduardo May Pereira, President of Caldura Dhamma Association, Uruguay. He is going to speak on peace through understanding. Most Venerable, Venerable Ashin Yanisaro, members of the Maha Sangha, ladies and gentlemen, buenos dias, good morning. This paper aims to develop important aspects for obtaining a correct understanding of our experience, of reality, of truth, and thus to obtain the states of peace in its highest expression, coming from wisdom and understanding. To achieve this, it is necessary to introduce some Buddhist principles about reality and its functioning. functioning. Given this, we will apply the practical approach that Buddha teaches us to acquire states of happiness and peace sought by all beings in the world. What is reality or truth? It is the translation of the Pali word Satcha. Two aspects of the world in the original language must be considered. For something to be real, continuity is required, is needed. There should be also, there should be also an element of consensus. That is what makes it true or real in the conventional sense. According to Buddhism, there are two kinds of realities or truth, ultimate and conventional. We will begin with a brief explanation of the Buddhist paradigm of truth. This tells us that reality is composed of matter and the reality of the mind. We can say that on its discovery, it's based the Buddha's enlightenment. These are the final, the final and irreducible components of existence and are, are called dhammas. About the material process, uh, we can say that it is related to the primary elements or property elements. So we can say that it's about earth, air, fire, and water, among other pro material properties. We need to consider that matter that, that does not have cognitive ability, does not have skill to know by itself. We must add regarding the material process that always happen at the present moment. Mind process consists of co conscious, consciousness and material factor. It is, important, it is important to under, understand that it is an immaterial process of reality. We cannot see it, touch it, or find it in space. It is the mind that, that has cognitive ability. Mind knows objects that we experience. Mind objects are beyond time and space. It has the ability to project the past and future. Each Dhamma 
mental and material has a particular or intrinsic characteristic. Regardless time or place in which it manifests itself, it is always the same, is immutable. Each dhamma has a feature that makes it different from the other, and every time it arises, it manifests itself with an individual characteristic. Here we find the sense of continuity that the world in the original language show about reality. These dhammas also have a common characteristic that are called universal. These are impermanence and satisfactory and impersonality. This means that they are subject to rise and cease. This gives an unsatisfactory character to experience and is beyond our control. They arise and disappear independently of our will. These are conditioned realities, dependent on causes and conditions to rise, stay, and disappear. They are subject of the universal laws of mind functioning and matter. Everything in our experience consists of this inseparable pair of mental and material phenomena that form reality in the ultimate sense. So far, we have been describing the final and irreducible component of experience, ultimate reality, the dhammas, truth discovered by the Buddha by his own effort and wisdom. Everything in the experience of being is composed of these dhammas and it is subject to nature and its characteristic. We are born, we grow old and die in this reality. Based on this reality, Mind builds and creates what is known as conventional or conceptual. This reality is created by the mind of being and is based on common agreements. We see visible form through the appropriate sensory base and mind conceptualize it, giving a name or concept. We can say the same for the other sense doors. Here come everything related to mental activity, concepts, thoughts, emotions, ideas, etc., that always arises depending on ultimate realities. Once the connection between the mind and the corresponding sense ob objects, mind has a natural function of conceptualizing this experience. There is something created by the mind, and through learning process, through education, we deepen and specialize it, specialize in it. Here we find the consensus side of the meaning of the word satya. Both realities are part of our experience and we cannot get rid of either. Concepts and conventions are, use, are useful and a necessary function of the mind for the development of our existence in the world. But it is necessary to understand the differ, their different nature. An important difference is that, is that while ultimate reality is impermanent and subject to rise and cease, conventions and concepts and ideas are not subject to this feature and can remain over time. Another important aspect to mention is that conventions may differ according to time and place. Language, customs, religion are examples of this. Comprehension of these two realities is the key. We must understand that conventions are not reality at the ultimate sense. Concepts always depend on ultimate realities, dhammas. It is like a shadow that always arises in dependence of an object. Both are real in the continuity of being, but dhammas exist independently of mind, constructive functions. Without ultimate reality, there are not concepts, concepts or conventions. The experience of reality to a particular individual is formed by a succession of material and mental objects which are experiencing, experienced through sense doors from birth to death. Experience has a passive side. Some objects are given and we cannot do anything about it. Our body and five senses are examples of this. We must accept this part of experience. There is also an active part which relates to what we do with objects, with objects we experience in our life, the action or reaction generated. 
we experience ultimate reality, then mind constructs conceptual or, co or conventional reality, and based on this construction, each individual operates and interacts with the world. This happens at a very high speed. The way to relate to this object is critical. If we want to achieve peace, we must clearly understand this object and comprehend the natural law that govern our existence. We must start with a correct view of reality and regulate our actions to the way reality is, not acting against it, adjusting our views to the way nature works. For this, the Buddha teaches us the path, the practical way to relate to our experience and how to obtain and realize peace and happiness. We must review our belief and start with a correct one. This means that actions, our actions generate results and we are heirs of this. This is our own real property. We must investigate this reality with our mind, gaining understanding in a way that, in a way that instead of believing the truth, we can contemplate it in our own mind. We need to examine, examine what we believe because it is related to our actions and lead them. Through practice, we develop comprehension of reality so we can see it without need to believe. We must face the experience from an ethical point of view, establish our actions in such a way that we do not generate damage, uh, damage and suffering to other beings. Most of the sufferings that being experienced in the world is due to ethical transgression. It is like a protection. If we do not tra transgress ethics, we don't generate suffering in others and avoid created conditions to experience mental state as grief and suffering. In a future, in future experience, they oppose and are an obstacle to peace. We have to identify ourselves through suffering. No being wants to suffer and everybody seeks peace, peace and happiness. Then come mental development. This means to develop the ability of observation of reality from this perspective. In this way, we work and manage our own suffering. Through contemplation of reality and mental training, we can access the truth nature of reality, to see the truth with our own mind. Throughout this training, to see oneself and comprehend the truth and the obstacles to peace and happiness, we must develop the ability to focus, concentrate, and, and stabilize the mind. Unification in our experience is needed. Remember the ability of the mind to be able to take objects from the past and future and remote objects as well. Mind and matter in the same place and time is necessary. Whatever there is to be discovered or seen, it is at the present moment. The reality of our experience is always in the present, where we can influence through a proper and correct appreciation. It is by, by recognizing the present moment to train the mind to see reality clear grow in insight on the true nature of reality without getting caught in the construction we make of it. To observe, observe the concepts and conventions mentally built and understand its true nature. Thus, we can discern the content of these constructions. This is, an, this is important because our actions in the world respond to these constructions and evolution of reality. We must cultivate stability and tranquility in opposition to the constant change of nature, arising and ceasing. We must cultivate happiness and welfare state in opposition to the unsatisfactory feature of existence. We must cultivate and strengthen certain qua qualities of our being, per uh, personality, healthy mental qualities that are support of, of our practice. In this way, we can offer and connect to the world through states such as compassion, generosity, sense of well-being, equanimity, and among others. Uh, conclusion. Path to peace requires the recognition of reality with a clear understanding. If we want peace, we must see reality with its true nature. Look after our action, act in a harmless way, going in the flow of nature, and not against. Once there is understanding, we can let go, give up mental states, views, and belief that hinder our and prevent us from peace. Peace and happiness come from an understanding that reality is beyond what we think, the way we construct the world. How we handle this mental state is essential and require clear recognition. True peace begins in the mind of oneself, and it's not dependent on the conditions. 
of the world. It depends on clear understanding of reality, not on beliefs. To see and understand reality by yourself with discernment of the way things are is a path to unconditional peace. Wonder is understanding, cultivation and develop of, uh, development of mental state that support peace within us and benefits the world, make it easier. Compassion, goodwill and desire for well-being to others, this is what we can offer and contribute to peace. If we know well the true nature of the conventions under which we live, we can find release and liberation. But through these conventions is that we relate to the world. It is a useful tool for something, just that. We cannot get rid of conventional reality. It is needed to investigate in our own experience, reviewing conventions, concepts on po of, and points of view about reality. We must see clearly if we are attached to conventions that go against nature and the way reality is. Change is, is natural, the constant flow of phenomena, the rise and fall of everything we experience. This constant, constant change generates dissatisfaction, instability, friction, conflict, pain, suffering. It is also essential to understand that this natural process of life of every individual is out of control. The material and the mental phenomena arise and disappear independently of our will. Our body gets sick, grow old and die without our permission. Follows the natural process that rule existence. The same for mental state. They come and go beyond our, our will. Peace can be obtained by the development of concentration and tranquility of mind. This is not the ultimate sense of peace. This is temporary, superficial, and dependent on condition. But the, there is peace in a higher sense that comes from insight, discernment, acceptance, and understanding of reality as it is. The understanding that comes from contemplation of the experience of reality through nature is the door to liberation and peace in the ultimate sense. True peace comes through understanding. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Mr. Laudaro, Eduardo Mepreira, for your excellent speech. And you rightly pointed out the importance of mental development to appreciate and experience the true nature of the reality. Now, before we break for lunch, on behalf of the organizing committee, um, Now, uh, our delegate from Russia is going to present a gift from Russia to our most respected city group, Seattle. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Next, our delegate from Kamigia, Russia, is going to present a Dharma gift to the Venerable Siddhi Gusiaro. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.
Before our lunch break, I'll, on behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to thank our most respected venerable Seattle's for chairing the morning session and our excellent, courageous, enlightened, and uh, thought-provoking speech speaker from Latin America and also from Iran and Thailand for your excellent speech. But uh, I have to apologize for cutting you short and also our attentive audience for your patience and your attentiveness is really appreciation of our conference. Thank you very much. Our afternoon session starts one at 1 p.m. this afternoon, and we're going to have a panel discussion. with seven speakers. So you have uh, the opportunity to raise your question and also share your view on the conference. Thank you very much. See you after lunch. <laughs>